heard as we talk about going into election season. Uh, I'm Harold Love Jr. I am a state representative here in Nashville, Tennessee. I represent uh, District 58, which uh, comprises a major portion of the city of Nashville. I have seven colleges in my district. Uh, four of them are historically black colleges, Fish University, American Baptist College, Mary Medical College, and Tennessee State University. So when we talk about lobbying, oftentimes, uh, even though schools engage in the process of uh, trying to get policy change, I think it's important when we talk about lobbying to start with a foundational question about, you know, why should somebody lobby? Why should somebody engage in the process of trying to help form policy? And the, and the foundation of this question uh, of why should someone lobby is the question of who governs, uh, the question of who is in the process of helping shape and forming policy. And so there is a uh, about a two or three uh, different views about you know who governs. And oftentimes we think that people who govern are just those who are elected. And oftentimes we feel as though we don't have a role to uh, play in the governing process because we are not the elected or we don't have the financial means to influence the elected. And so there is uh, there's a, a perspective about being elected or being in the upper echelon of power that lends itself to being the ones making decision, and that's this this notion of elitism. Uh, elitism suggests that democracy in America is controlled by wealthy and influential people, and that they use their position and their power to help form public policy. And that it's a small group of people, and they have the access to capital, they have the access to political knowledge, and because they have this access they don't allow other people to even get in the room to talk about how policy should be formed. And, and this image of elitism, uh, unfortunately, is supported by what we oftentimes see in campaign contributions, what we see uh, in electoral support. And as a result, the masses of people oftentimes do not get engaged in the process. There's another uh, perspective about who governs, which uh, refers to pluralism. Uh, this pluralist view suggests that everybody can govern because everybody has opportunity to engage in the process. Uh, this pluralist model suggests that because all of us have access at a certain age uh, with certain requirements being met to be able to vote, we can be engaged in the process of governing. And it also suggests that even if you are not qualified to vote, maybe you are not of the age to vote, or maybe you have a felony on your record and hasn't been expunged and your voting rights have not been restored, you can still influence policy, you can still engage in the process, you can still urge people to go out and vote. And in that realm, you're still participating in this pluralist model about who has opportunity to govern. There's another uh, lens of who governs, uh, which refers to coalitions. And this is where organizations collectively decide that they are going to engage in the process of governing. And this is oftentimes seen when you have different organizations come together around a policy issue. They may, they may not agree on all the issues in a certain area, but because this particular issue is uh, important to them collectively, they will do coalition building. And so that's just to give us an example of uh, you know the different views of who governs, but it also sets the tone about uh, lobbying because if we don't feel as though we have the right to govern, we won't be engaged in the process. And so there is this, uh, this need to understand also about you know, what is the role of the elected? And, and, and depending upon the person's view toward their role as the elected will also inform us on how much uh, pressure we need to put on them in office to get them to understand our perspective on the particular bill that they are thinking about uh, putting forth or the policy they're thinking about putting forth. And so three types of representation I want to also lift up for us this morning to talk about the importance of also lobbying and policy making. The first uh, perspective of representation is called the trustee. This is where the elected person feels as though they have been endowed with a particular kind of knowledge to do their particular job. Uh, the person may feel as though their years of experience working in government or their years of experience being around those who are in the office uh, has endowed them with a particular type of knowledge to do that particular job. The danger in this particular trustee model is that the trustee uh, model lends itself to the person in office not necessarily feeling as though they have to engage their constituency or engage those who have elected them 
to get any more knowledge about how they should do their job. Particularly, you see this uh, happen in those who are elected at the city, uh, state, or federal legislative levels. All right, when when they're in policy making levels in that legislative body, oftentimes you see the trustee feel as though they don't have to engage the general public. But you do also see this happen at the executive level because a person may feel as though they don't have to engage the general public about decision making in this policy realm. A second kind of representation can be seen uh, in the view of a delegate. Uh, this person feels as though they have been delegated to carry out the wishes of their constituency. This uh, particular person feels as though that they've been, uh, they've been elected and they must stay in constant contact with their constituencies. These, these examples can be seen in persons who oftentimes refer to, I'm voting the will of my people. I'm voting the will of those who elected me. And, and they don't seem to express their own particular views, but the views of those who are uh, electing them to go to that particular office. And so this type of leadership can lend itself to being more pliable to those who are lobbying, uh, more open to those who would have conversation about them. And the third type is called political. This person kind of marries both the trustee and delegate model. Uh, they find a way to balance out this, these two models because what the trustee does is they say, listen, I may be endued with uh, certain knowledge, but I also think I can seek certain knowledge from my constituency. And so I also need to stay in contact with them and make sure that I understand what they want me to put forth. And, and this model lends itself to being open to conversations about that. Now, the issue is this. When we talk about lobbying, uh, we must talk about this uh, notion of what's called the Iron Triangle. And the Iron Triangle uh, model displays this process of how policy is made. At the top of the triangle is the elected official. At the bottom uh, corner is a bureaucracy or a department. And at the bottom other corner, corner is an interest group. And oftentimes what we find is uh, interest groups and people oftentimes seek solutions from departments or agencies and don't get a response. Then when they seek a response from the elected official, the elected official can then put pressure on that agency because the elected official controls the budget of that agency. But one of the problems we find is in informing policy, people oftentimes, again, don't feel as though they have a right to be in the elected officials uh, forming a policy triangle. And we, we remove ourselves from that process. Now, when we remove ourselves from the process, we automatically give more weight to those corporations give more weight to those professional lobbying firms, give more weight to those who have the perceived more power to influence policy. The very truth of the matter is this, that elected official who's at the top of that triangle only got there because of the votes of those who live in their respective districts. And oftentimes that is overlooked when we talk about the power of the electoral constituency. Yes, even though, uh, uh, corporations may contribute large dollars, even though businesses may contribute huge sums of money to campaigns. At the end of the day, those constituencies that elected them are the only ones that can elect them. You can have millions of dollars contribute to your campaign, but if it doesn't resonate, if your campaign does not resonate with the constituency that you are trying to get to vote for you, you will not be elected. And that's why lobbying is so important from a individual perspective because you are the person who lives in that district you are the person the only one a group of set of people who can elect or re-elect a person to that particular office and so this morning i once again get those foundational things into our minds so we understand how much power you have as an individual to approach your elected official about a policy issue that you want to see change or that you want to see implemented because it directly affects you. Now, here's where the conversation also needs to be had about why we should be engaged in the process. You and I must understand that we have a vested interest in policy that is being made because it affects us directly. Yes, corporations want policy change because it affects their business, but businesses will come and go. If nothing else, this pandemic has shown us that businesses will close and businesses will slow down. But at the end of the day, people will still be alive 
and people will still have to deal with the ramifications of policy that has changed. And so it's important for us to understand that as we engage in policy making, we must fundamentally, again, understand that we have a vested interest in this policy. Now, the problem occurs when we don't identify the vested interest. And oftentimes, middle to higher income socioeconomic status people identify the policy effect in their own lives. This is why you see people who will call their members of Congress, people who will, will lie to them about uh, particular things that address tax bracket issues because they're in certain middle or high income tax brackets. They want policy change or modified that will allow them to receive more benefits from the IRS tax code changes. You also see this happen when you have people who are dealing with criminal statutes and they want to ensure that the statutes that are passed do not negatively affect them in their life. And we as individuals also must understand that every law that is passed should have a person who is outside of the traditional lobbying groups up there calling or emailing or having conversations with the elected officials about how the policy will affect them. And the first key is this, you can learn about the policy by simply asking the elected official how this particular policy is going to affect your life. Now, why is this important? This is important because you need to be assured in your mind that number one, the elected official knows what the policy is going to do. This is one way you can also assure that uh, the, the corporations and the, the, the major lobbying firms aren't having more influence on the policy than you are. Ask the elected official how this particular bill is going to affect your life. Now, that's important because if they have been elected by you, they also live in the district where you live and it's going to affect their life also. And this is why you can also gain information because once you ask them how it's going to affect your life, you can then start that dialogue about why you think the policy should be implemented or not implemented. You can demonstrate to them why this particular policy is a negative uh, thing for your life and theirs or a positive thing. So that's the first step. Ask them how this policy is going to affect your life. The second thing you can also do is ask them how uh, married to the particular policy they are. Now, what I mean by that is this. Oftentimes, legislators will propose a bill or they'll be asked to propose a bill by an interest group or a, a lobbying firm that wants a particular piece of uh, policy change, and they may not be completely married to it. In this conversation, what you're trying to find out is how vested they are to this policy. And what you'll find is this, if they're not very vested to the policy, they may be able to either vote against it, or they may be able to also not carry that particular bill to the full extent that they would have ordinarily. Once you find out how married to the policy that they are, you can also engage them in a conversation about uh, maybe either they're not running the policy or about modifying the policy. There have been several instances where I've carried pieces of legislation and it started out containing A, B, C, D, E, and F. And by the time we started having conversations about the policy and the effects it would have on various interest groups and very uh, interested people, we found we've gotten out to A, B, C, and D. That came about because as we work with different groups and individuals, we found common ground so that more people would be uh, affected in a positive manner than other people. All right, there's a question about can I speak about Alec and how we can counter their lobby? All right. Uh, the uh, American Legislative Exchange Council is what Chuck Williams is referring to, this group called Alex. There's actually a group that uh, meets also, it's called SIX. Uh, they have a conference every year, and uh, it's, it's the state uh, legislative exchange uh, that they're talking about, and they propose legislation and give policy tips on people to, uh, to attend their functions also, and this is another way to do it. Now, what Alex does is this. Alec will propose legislation to uh, different members of different state legislators in the hopes that they can pass legislation across the country at state legislatures. Now, here's why voting at the federal level, at the state level, and the local level have different effects. Oftentimes, we focus our lobbying efforts on the federal government, but negate to focus our lobbying efforts on our state legislators. Here, here's the problem. Every 10 years, state legislators draw the lines of not just the state districts, but also congressional districts. And this is the power vested in the states. And so oftentimes what you'll find is we don't engage our state elected officials because, again, we don't think that we have the right to be there. 
Now, this is why, again, I go back to the opening statement I made. Everybody can govern. We have to make sure that we engage in that pluralistic model because pluralism gives everybody a chance to come to the table and talk about policy. Again, looking at the Iron Triangle model, if you find that a department or an agency is not responding to you and the elected official will respond to you, you are then providing them electoral support. So now somebody may say, well, well Representative Love, I don't have the dollars to contribute to a campaign. I don't have the dollars to write the big checks that everybody can, can write. But what you may have is the ability to volunteer on election day, the ability to volunteer during early voting. And what this does is this saves that, that particular elected official uh, the, the, the money that they need to go and hire somebody or the signs they need to buy to, to campaign. Is that lobbying? Yeah, because you're providing electoral support to that candidate. So once you talk about uh, whether the, the elected official understands the piece of legislation, whether they're married to the particular policy, the third thing you can do is talk about then what you think the particular bill does and how it has an effect on your life. Now, this requires some research. This will require you to then maybe sit down with other people and have them explain to you what the bill does. This is why coalition building is important because once you engage in a conversation with a group of people, you bring different experiences and different expertise to the table. There may be somebody in your particular neighborhood or in your particular circle that is very well versed at researching legislation, even tracking down whether the leg legislation came from a, another group that pushes a particular policy or it came from another state. Once you get that person involved in the process, they can then provide the research materials to your organization. Then once you get the information and you get well versed on what it does, you need to narrow down your what I call elevator speech. What does that mean? Every elected official has a certain limit number of, of minutes they can give to every conversation. And it's not because they don't want to hear everything you have to say, but because everybody else wants to also get into the room and talk to them. So we encourage people to develop what's called elevator speech. This is the speech you can give literally on the elevator as you're riding up or down the elevator with the elected official. If you can't get an appointment with them, you can get a, a chance to walk along the corridor with them. Uh, you get a chance to again ride the elevator or take the steps with them. Or if you do have a meeting with them, if it may be five or 10 minutes with them, you need to be able to narrow down your particular uh, question that you have, but also bring to them a perspective. It's also good if you can bring printed materials to the meeting because this will like to leave something with the legislator. Or if they're out and can't get to the meeting, you can leave those printed materials with someone in their office. This is very beneficial. It's oftentimes helped me because as someone's talking to you, you have several conversations run through your mind because you have the previous conversation you had about the bill, the current conversation you're having about it, and anticipating the next conversation you'll have about it. But if you have printed materials, you can review that after you have uh, had the conversation with somebody. So uh, get your elevator speech together, uh, have concise statements in your speech, and also bring printed materials. And also understand this, when you're talking to somebody about a particular policy you want changed or implemented, understand also there are people who also may want the opposite thing done. And this is where in the conversation, I've oftentimes asked people, uh, is there another perspective about this bill? And when they say, nope, it's not, mine is the only one, then I come and find out that there is another opinion about it. Uh, it it's kind of disheartening. And so there's nothing wrong with saying, well, there's a group out there that may uh, have a different perspective, but I would encourage you to also remember what I've suggested to you. And this again, gives you strength in, in that. Now, the fourth thing you can do is this, increase your numbers when you are in the lobbying effort. There's nothing I think more powerful than having people who email the elected official and the first couple of phrases in the paragraph is, I'm Harold Love, I live in your district, all right? Or I'm Harold Love and I'm your constituent. Or I'm Harold Love and I live uh, you know, next to your district. And I'm writing to you about House Bill 234 and list out what it does. These emails get a lot of attention and it's a way you can also get in touch with your legislator without having to have a meeting. Now, sometimes people think that we don't read the emails. Now we read the emails, and if elected official doesn't read the emails, you also then have an electronic copy that you send it to them. So when you have the conversation with their staffer about what was done uh, with the email, you can reference the email that was sent and when it was sent and what the response should have been. 
Now that's a powerful tool to use because a phone call message may not be retrieved, but an email can be seen. These are all tools to be used to engage in the lobbying effort. So again, one may ask, why should we lobby? Because you have a vested interest in governing. Let me go back to what I said at the very beginning. Do not allow the elitist model to determine who makes policy in your city or state or in your country. Use the pluralist model and the coalition model to decide who makes policy in your state and in your city. Also understand, do not let an elected official just use the trustee model. Do not let them think that they have this specially endowed knowledge and don't need to be in conversation with you about policy. Push on them that they are elected to represent you and that you will be there to, again, either ensure their re-election, right, or elect somebody that will not uh, ignore you. Now, keep in mind, you may not get your policy changed or implemented the first time you lobby. It's just like voting for somebody. You may not get the person elected the first time you vote for them, but you have to come back over and over again. What this also does is it builds up your consistency and demonstrate that you are not just maybe an, a one issue uh, person, even though you may have one particular issue you're concerned about, you need to also be concerned about other issues because they may indirectly affect you. This also gives you a chance when you're coalition building to maybe work with other coalitions that have an issue that they want to see pushed. And it may not necessarily directly affect you, but you provide support to their coalition. This gives you an opportunity the next time around when you need to help from them, you can reach out to them about getting support from their coalition for your particular issue. This is a very powerful tool and people don't realize this. This is how organizations band together. This is why you may see that the ACLU and NAACP and other organizations oftentimes will push a particular initiative together and they may not push another one together for another few months, but on that particular issue, they have worked together. They got to this place because in the past, they gave support to another issue and work together. This is a very powerful tool that should not be ignored because it allows coalition building to be a particularly strong uh, tool to be used. Now, constituencies must understand that when they engage the elected official, the elected official can depend upon you for knowledge. So when there are meetings to be held and a question is asked about something with the policy, if you don't know the answer, it's okay to say, I don't know, but I will get back with you on the answer. This then gives a, a chance for you to, to have a second meeting and follow up with them with more printed materials. I've had several meetings where I've asked a question of somebody and said, you, you know, do you have uh, more information? And they said, well, we'll get it back to you, Representative Love. And they did follow up with that. All right, so I did want to leave some time uh, for some questions. Uh, if, if our moderator, if, if we have any questions that anybody wants to ask about the importance of lobbying or other ways that we can talk about the, the importance of coalition building. If you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat. Good morning. Um, we have, good morning. We do have a question so far, and it says, can you speak about the ALAC and how we can counter their lobbying? Yeah, that was a question about ALEC, and, and we, we talked about the fact that uh, the American Legislative, Legislative Exchange Council oftentimes pushes uh, legislation across different states uh, to, to get different legislators to carry the same bill. And there's a different exchange council uh, called SIX, and it's called State Innovative Exchange. And they uh, oftentimes uh, meet at the fall of the year, and you can attend that meeting. Uh, I would also encourage you uh, to, at the state level, uh, attend the National Black Caucus of State Legislators. Uh, this meets normally the last part of November to December. And for the federal level, I would encourage you to attend the Congressional Black Caucus. That uh, meets usually in September. Uh, this year, their meeting is going to be uh, virtual. And so this is a good opportunity for you to really attend that meeting and, and attend different panels that will be presented all across a different uh, policy issue. So again, Congressional Black Caucus annual meeting will be virtual this year. And the National Black Caucus of State Legislators meeting will be virtual this year. So NBCSL, nbcsl.org, 
uh, uh, you can get that website and, and attend that meeting. Also, Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, you can attend that meeting. And when you attend that meeting, you can learn more about policy issues again, at the federal level and the state level. And you can get with, with uh, different people across the country and develop networks uh, that you can depend upon. Because what's going to be important also is if you're thinking about going, getting into uh, helping form policy in your particular state or city, it's good to have people across the country at different states to discover what they may be doing in their state and how they're combating bad legislation. All right, other questions? Someone wanted to review the Iron Triangle, um, elitist, trustees, and pluralists. Okay, you wanna go over the Iron Triangle and go over the elitism, pluralism models, is that correct? That's correct. All right. So again, the, the elitist model uh, is, is one of the models I was talking about when, when we talk about who governs, okay? So the iron triangle, elitist, trustee, and pluralist, all right, I'm, I'm gonna give you the, uh, the pluralist, elitism, and coalition building uh, review first because that fits into the issue of who governs, right? So the elitist model about who governs is that there are select few people in the country who should govern uh, our uh, republic, right? And, and, and it's not just the elected, but also it is powerful corporations and those with political knowledge and political access. And the elitism model suggests that even though you and I are taxpayers, that we should not be engaged in the process because we don't have the particular knowledge or the power base to make decisions. And that we should just allow them to make decisions for us. That model uh, oftentimes excludes African-Americans, particularly other people of color, because it is assumed that even if we do have an African-American or person of color in the room, they're selected by this, this elite group. And that model tends to keep uh, large communities uh, out of the governing process. The pluralist model uh, says that because everybody has a chance to vote, or even if you don't have the chance to vote, you have the chance to influence a vote, that everybody should be given the chance to decide who governs. The pluralist model gives everybody a chance to have a voice because it affects everybody. The pluralist model tries to engage the largest number of people in the process. The pluralist model also is complementary to a coalition building model, which suggests that people from various groups can find common ground and they can help uh, decide what policy should be. Now, let me add this piece in there that I didn't talk about earlier. One of the keys to talking about who governs has to be this notion of what I call linked fate, all right? So it doesn't make sense for Harold Love to believe that I can go out here and engage in helping policy be formed and voting for a person to serve in office and disregard the fact that I am part of a larger community of black people in Nashville. I have a linked fate with people of color in the city of Nashville. I have a linked fate with people of color in the state of Tennessee. I have a linked fate with people who may be oppressed or subject to issues of oppression. And I have to conduct myself in a manner that uh, acknowledges that I have a linked fate with them. And when I do that, it allows me to have more group consciousness or race consciousness because I realize that we are in this situation together and I can't just run off and decide who I want to vote for without having conversations with and coalition, coalition building with people who have a similar situation as mine. And so when we have a pluralist model that is prevalent, we allow a linked fate model also to be prevalent because it encourages us to think about others. So I don't just go in there and just vote for somebody uh, without thinking about how it's going to affect my community and how it's going to affect my children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and aunts and, and grandparents because we all have a linked fate. Now the iron triangle model is where we describe how policy is made. At the top of the triangle is an elected official. At the uh, bottom 
uh, right hand corner will say is a department or an agency and the bottom left hand corner is an interest group or people. Now, oftentimes we engage in conversations with departments and agencies seeking solutions from them, right? So we have oftentimes gone, anybody has had experience that you know, if you go to the Department of Education or Department of Human Services, or you go to a um, uh, Department of Transportation seeking solutions and you can't get your situation resolved, you pick up the phone and you call the elected official. When the elected official calls that department or agency, they get a faster response because that elected official controls the budget of that department or agency. Now, that's how policy gets made, but the elected official has to be elected, and so they need electoral support. They need you to vote for them, and that's how policy is made. It is, is it made, it's made by conversation between interest groups, elected officials, and departments and agencies. All right, so we talked about the Iron Triangle. We talked about the elitist model. Now about the trustee and the delegate uh, perspective. This refers to the relationship that the elected official thinks that they have with how they should govern. The trustee model suggests that they believe that they are endowed with a certain particular knowledge that everybody else doesn't have and that they don't need to be in contact with their constituency. And this model is very pervasive in a lot of elected officials because they think that they don't need to be in contact with constituencies and they just, they just need to go and vote the way they want to vote and ignore the constituencies. The delegate model suggests that you have to be engaged with the constituency because they elected you to be there. And this model suggests that you have town hall meetings, that you have uh, communication with, with your constituencies and that you are in constant contact with them about how you should vote. Now, this model sometimes is not able to be carried out if you are uh, unable to get a meeting very quick. That's why the political model is a balance of trustee and delegate because it acknowledges that you are going to be in contact with the constituency, but also acknowledges that they also sent you there to make some decisions based upon what you ran upon for a campaign promise or platform and based on the fact that you have a general knowledge of what they want done in their district. And so the political model is one of three with the trustee and delegate models. All right, there's a question here. Uh, define advocacy versus lobbying since the latter has implications for the nonprofit organization churches. All right, so you can advocate and you can do the same work as people who do lobbying. It's just, just different words. And so oftentimes to uh, uh, Ms. Walker's point, you don't want to as a nonprofit be accused of lobbying. And so you want to say that you're coming to advocate for a bill. And so it, they, do, they do the same work, but you just want to define the terms differently and use a different term. So you can advocate for policy change. You can advocate for uh, different uh, things to be done within even policy. And let me encourage you, just because you see a bill written and you see it moving through a committee, don't be discouraged. You can always, again, go through those four or five steps I gave you, which is contact the elected official and find out you know, how much they know about the bill they're carrying. Find out how married to the bill that they are and also get your elevator speech together and, and talk to them about how it affects you. All right. Uh, there's a difference between is a difference between advocates, uh, activists and a libelous. And if so, what mistakes do activists make while trying to effectuate change? All right. Yeah, there's a difference between being an activist and being a lobbyist. Uh, oftentimes uh, we see uh, activists who think that uh, the only way to bring about change is to be on the outside of the the building and, and the committee meeting and and outside of the meeting area with, with the elected official and you can be an activist in your activities and you can also advocate right you need to have a, a plan of how you're going to bring about change because you can effectuate change as an activist as long as you keep the door open to still have that conversation with the elected official. What you don't want to do is only have one way to effectuate change. You don't want to have a situation where uh, only uh, being in an agitational mode, right, is, is the way you bring about change. The truth be told, agitation occurs from the outside and inside. Agitation occurs from meetings inside, coordinated with activities outside. And oftentimes, I think we missed the opportunity to have coordination of these activities. It's, it's no better example 
than one can see when elected officials are able to be in conversation with other elected officials about why people are protesting. Uh, this happened particularly in Nashville when I had a conversation with my colleagues about bills that were being proposed and they asked, you know, why are the folks out there protesting? I said, because of the bill that we passed last week. I said, let's get in here now and make some changes to this legislation so we can bring about change to our community. So you can uh, advocate, uh, which is the same activities as, as lobbying if you're with a nonprofit organization. And uh, if you're gonna be in the activist mode you still need to be in conversation with elected officials about the different ways to effectuate change because what you don't want to do is be labeled as only having one mode of bringing about change. And again, if you notice what I said earlier, you got to know what kind of relationship the elected official thinks they have with their community. You don't want a situation where they think that they are going to be a trustee and that's how they're going to operate. You have to bring them back around and remind them that they are really elected by you. And that's why it's important in that iron triangle model to understand that you have the power to provide electoral support. You are the only person that can get them elected if you live in that district. Again, it doesn't matter how much money that the lobbyists contribute to the campaigns. It doesn't matter how long they've been there. If people don't vote for them, they cannot be in their position. And so it's important. All right. Uh, how can we organize? How can organizations like Black Lives Matter go from agitating to coordinating legislation? I think organizations like Black Lives Matter can coordinate with elected officials who will be caring for a policy that will benefit them uh, to talk about what it looks like to have that policy put forth. It's nothing wrong with having a conversation. I think what has happened is we've gotten so jaded by elected officials that we think that it's taboo to sit down with an elected official. We've been so jaded by um, the word politician that we, you know, and we even see it happen. I'm not a politician. I, I'm, and, and well, you're involved in the political process, right? And, and so it's okay to have a conversation uh, with an elected official about policy change, particularly if you're an organization that, you know, that, that is closest to the ground with helping people. That's who I refer to as what we call street level bureaucrats, right? These are persons who are right there with people and, and know what's going on. It's, it's important to have this information. If you think about earlier what I've talked about with the delegate model and, and how they can seek information from their constituencies, you can say Black Lives Matter is a constituency and Black Lives Matter as an organization uh, deserves the respect and conversation with the elected official. This is where, even like in Nashville, Tennessee, Black Lives Matter was in conversation with elected officials about how to write up our uh, community oversight board plan. Now, they were the ones who pushed the agenda for getting on a referendum to be voted on, but at the end of the day, they're also in conversation with elected officials about getting the policy implemented. So I, I don't want us to think that talking to elected officials and coordinating with them is a taboo thing. You still preserve your, your, uh, your, your um, integrity when you have the conversation, but at the end of the day, it's elected officials who bring about policy change. I had colleagues in Colorado who passed legislation around the George Floyd Act to bring about police reform, and they had conversations with different organizations. This is how policy is made, and it's important for us to understand when we advocate, right? When we are talking about, you know, bringing about policy, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, yes, working across the nation in California. But it's, again, I don't want us to think that it's taboo to have these conversations. I also don't want us to think that we don't have a right to be at the table. So again, as I said earlier, we got to understand the different lenses of how uh, governing is viewed. We cannot allow people who are of an elitist mindset to think that they are the only ones who will be at the table forming policy. We must, as a group, swing it back around to a pluralist model. We have to in empower people. We can even empower persons who don't have the right to vote right now. We can empower teenagers. We can uh, empower those who have felonies on their record to still be involved in the process. They can still advocate for change because they have a voice and they can influence persons who will elect people. So everybody can advocate. Everybody can lobby. Everybody can agitate. We just have to be able to coordinate efforts better because there's nothing worse than having an uncoordinated, uncoordinated effort that ends up in policy that was gonna hurt everybody being passed because we were afraid to talk to people or we didn't feel like talking to folks or we felt like if we talked to elected official, it was going to you know, absolve us of our integrity. You can still have your integrity 
uh, with your interest groups, but you've got to understand at the end of the day, policies, policy will still be made. That's why if I can for a moment touch on the importance of voting, we cannot afford to sit out voting because policy will be made by those who are elected. So if you hold your vote and you abstain from voting after the election, somebody is still going to be elected. And that policymaker will be making policy and you won't be able to say, I'm Harold Love and, and I voted for you or voted against you. You can say, I'm Harold Love and I, I didn't vote, but I want you to still make policy change. That's a little bit more difficult um, argument to make. All right. Uh, at least his mindset uh, must diminish in the black. Yes, we have to, to diminish that in the black organizations because they have to be effective beyond ourselves. And you're right. The elitist model oftentimes discourages the average member from engaging. And that's why we have to, even in organizations, we can't have an elitist model. We have to have in our organizations a pluralist model that everybody has a right to engage in the process, even in organizations. Everybody's voice is valuable and everybody's voice needs to be heard. And again, don't forget about the, the, the trustee, delegate, and political models of how the elected official views themselves. And don't forget about, again, the linked fate model. That there's nothing more uh, disruptive than people thinking that we don't have a linked fate. We are linked in our fates. And oftentimes, persons of color have discovered that because they thought that their, their position or their, their, their income absolved them from being treated as if they were part of the same group. But then they soon found out they were still part of the same group of people of color. And so we can't allow ourselves to think that we aren't linked in our faiths together. That's why it's so important to talk about you know, voting in coalitions and voting in blocks because it allows us to uh, do that. Let me also encourage you to do this. We must also be engaged in various information networks because oftentimes we absolve ourselves from being involved in these information networks. Or well, what is the information network? Our neighborhood associations, our parent teacher organizations. These are information networks where elected officials oftentimes seek information about policy that should be changed or implemented. Our neighborhood associations, our parent teacher organizations, and our faith organizations are all information networks that can provide elected officials information about what our perspectives are about our political views and about our political behavior because elected officials do look at political behavior when we're talking about patterns of how folks vote you don't understand how how important it is because elected officials have a record of who votes in elections and so it's important to know that they have patterns and models to look at how your political activity has been engaged in in the last uh few years all right any other questions All right. I did want to touch on one other thing before I left. Uh, the issue I spoke earlier about vested interests. We have to understand we have a vested interest in policy that is made because it affects our life and the life of our children, grandchildren, aunts, uncles, and, and other people. We have a vested interest and we can't allow the elite to think that they're the only person that have a vested interest in policy that's made. We also have a best interest in policy that is made. All right. Any other questions before we get out? All right. If, if not, I'm going to put in here. Uh, if you got any questions you want to follow up with me, I'm going to put my email in here. Here's any follow up questions. Oh, sure. Yeah. Share it with your Sunday school class. Please do. All right. That's my email right there. You can contact me there uh, via email. And also, uh, that's my email there. Uh, the email will get me. All right. Uh, and last time I did a session on this with the Rethinking Church, I discussed a class that I was using. Uh, I have a syllabus that I can share with you also to talk about uh, these steps of even African-American politics. And it's going from understanding these different roles of elitism, uh, pluralist and, and delegate and trustee models. Uh, and we can also look at that information. All right.
Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for your attendance at the session.